Hello, everybody. Turn this up in my headphones, Charles. <laughs> that was a little late. So I was going to say, sleeper hit right here. Yeah. All right. all right, all right, all right. Hello, hello, hello. Everybody, one and all, welcome to yet another very exciting episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. My name is Charles, and with me today, as always, is my lifelong friend and co-host, Dylan. I'm ready to talk some fantasy with my friend, Charles. I am ready to talk some fantasy with my friend as well, Dylan, but not just oh. any fantasy today. <laughs> Timing is interesting today. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because we're doing a short story today, Charles, and mm. the whole timing of that is a whole lot different than what we're used to with these massive novels that we are typically reading. You know, we're in the middle of a buddy read of The Wheel of Time, yes. and uh, speaking of timing, a lot longer to read through a book in that series, and I know I really enjoyed getting into The Paper Menagerie by yes. Ken Liu, and I I mean, we have a little bit of a background with this one, Charles, if if you want to get into that. Sure. Well, people might know that during our Friends Pitching Fantasy, Dylan had pitched the whole collection, the Paper Menagerie and other stories, and I did not choose it. Mm -hmm. Um, Instead, I had to choose the seasoned veteran murder bot uh, because (laughs) it was time, and we had this quasi compromise that we would maybe sprinkle out some of these short stories from Paper Menagerie across the reading schedule to kind of keep things spicy as we get deep into Ooh. things like Wheel of Time and and First Law Universe and stuff like that. So when we're like nine books into those series, we can still have some fresh stories uh, throughout. And we're starting that with the Paper Menagerie today, just the Paper Menagerie. Um Dylan, do you want to give your cursory spoiler warning here? Right. Well, we're going to be spoiling things from the very brief story that is The Paper Menagerie by Ken Liu. And I think that if you haven't yet uh, read The Paper Menagerie, now is a great time to do that. You can crank that out pretty quick, actually. It's also available. It sounds like you, listener, probably enjoy listening to things i would imagine and there is an audiobook version of the paper menagerie read by the great lavar burden available on spotify that you can listen to for free i'll probably have tweeted that out at some point by <laughs> now and and i'm sure you can find it by just searching the paper menagerie i would guess on spotify so yeah, I do think now's a good time to turn it down in your headphones if you don't want the Paper Menagerie spoilers, but you can catch up super quick, and I advise going over to to find a way to read it and then come back here because it is mm-hmm. an incredible and award-winning, massively award-winning uh, short story. So, yeah, that's my Well said. Warning. Yep, if you haven't listened, go ahead and pause, read the handful of pages that it is. It won't take you long or listen to that. <laughs> no. 40-ish minute audio recording and come back because we've got a very exciting conversation here. So let's get into the discussion. Dylan, the paper menagerie. I'm going to say you were right. It was excellent. (laughs) Um, Worthy of all the praise. It's a really clever, thoughtful, thought-provoking short story. And I enjoyed it quite a bit. Well said, Charles. I mean, yeah, we're far from the first folks to call the paper menagerie excellent. Mm -hmm. It is an extremely highly acclaimed short story. It's super deep, as a lot of Ken Liu's work is. I I think that his work, I, I know he wouldn't care to make this kind of distinction but it does feel in this more like capital l literature (laughs) style speculative fiction this could have easily been like something you have to read for like the sats or like an ap exam or in english or something like that where it's like write this essay theorizing on the themes of this story you know it's it's got enough um meat on the bones with its 
with its themes that and any English class could spend hours kind of going into <laughs> going into all the stuff that's going Shout on here. Shout out to Mr. Miller, Shout our English out. teacher. <laughs> so, oh, yes. He'd have a field day with this one. <laughs> he'd love it. <laughs> we should shoot him an email with <laughs> a heads up that he should check out the paper menagerie. So, Charles, there has been a bit of a Twitter campaign to mm-hmm. that is hashtag make trolls cry really um, <laughs> i i might have gotten the the hashtag a little bit wrong it's really just the, the fong of ember lane at tony the thong on on twitter started mm-hmm. tweeting something of that sort he's a big fan of the paper menagerie i wanted to give him a shout out and yeah i I want to know, Charles. I think the world wants to know because I've read this book three times and I have <laughs> cried to various extents three times. I've read this book. I've read the short story three times. I've cried to various extents three times. Charles, did you cry? Did Charles cry is the question being asked after reading the paper menagerie. Mm-hmm. Well, I will say that when we got to the point where he's reading the letter, right? And we're <laughs> yes. reading the letter, okay? There is maybe a moment if maybe someone watching me read looked really closely that the eyes got a bit misty. There may have been a hand kind of wiping the eye a little bit, but, you know, it was very emotional. And <laughs> I would count that as crying, I suppose, right? When you when you get all misty-eyed, you know, that's crying. I wasn't as like, close as you ever get, I imagine. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I cry at stuff all the time. And this one well, was we certainly had... emotional. I, you know, part of the thing we say at the show is we're lifelong, at the start of the show, is that we're lifelong friends. Charles and I have known each mm-hmm. other quite some time. And we still had a text exchange before this. This is the first time I, I am finding out whether or not Charles cried. But right. <laughs> in advance, I was hoping he, he would cry. Yeah, of course. And I had to ask him. Ha- First, I started ha- with, have you cried in general? And he did say, yes, yes he has cried yes, before. I'm a human which was being. Nice to know. <laughs> yes. And then the next question was, have you ever cried from a fantasy novel? And mm. yeah, that seemed. The mi- a I bit, think the yeah. misty eye, the one hand wipe, you know, that's about as far as I've gotten from a fantasy novel. So this is. Like, in terms of emotional response, way, way up there, for sure. And in, like, this 20 pages or gets. something, you know? It's very impressive. Um, the amount oh. of emotion that Ken Liu was able to pack into this. I had the... I found the hashtag. It's hashtag mission make Charles cry. So wow. the mission continues. Charles has only grown... I mean, come on. This counts, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, this is... This is as close as it gets, and that really speaks to the paper menagerie and how much of a poignant story it is. I mean, I the first couple times that I read it, I probably needed that good old bucket for my tears because mm. I was absolutely bawling. Oh. I will say the I reread it again in short order from the last time I read it and I still I had probably one step past that misty eyed bit for this this third read okay. where it was like tear streaming like single <laughs> tear streaming down my uh, face as right. I thought about how touching the yeah the letter part it's the letter where, part right yeah, I think like, that's everybody's that's... like gut punch is when the letter gets translated and you read about the mom's tragic story and right like the very modest goal of just wanting to connect with her son and kind of missing that opportunity you know it's it's very emotional so um really impactful stuff and i think you know dylan that reaction is very reasonable for this read it's you know it's got everything it's got like this tragic story of this poor mom dying of cancer and this Mm -hmm. son who's like growing up in America and in a place where there's not a lot of people that understand Chinese culture and he's facing some some racism from that and he's right. trying to distance himself from from his Chinese heritage and that's all the mom knows and it's it's hard to watch it unfold and it, even 
the the narration comes from this point of view where he understands that you know oh i was a teenager i thought i knew everything like this that and the other and um it's something a lot of us can relate to at least our relationship with our parents and it's just so honest and it it, it cuts deep right yeah these super deep themes of acculturation exist throughout yeah. this story 100%. and i love how ken lu presents it in such a nuanced way where there aren't really clear villains or anything in the paper menagerie there's just a bunch of people trying to do their best in a system that has not set them up to really have easy answers to how to grapple with these questions and with these forces like racism like acculturation like just being uh people who hold their identities in the place where they are living and i think a lot there are of course a lot of mistakes made by the characters but i i don't Mm -hmm. think i think that everyone in here is to various extents well-intentioned or like making mistakes because they were children and teenagers and things like that. And that's something I really love about Ken Liu's work in general is usually very nuanced and and complex and presents people in all their complexities like this. Yes. And, you know, he really understood the perspective of this teenager. You know, I'm willing to bet he's writing at some point from some sort of like honest place in his own life i would imagine it's just too real not to um but yeah it's there's so many like subtle moments in this that you that kind of pile on and you kind of get the sense of what the mom's story is like and how she's giving the son space and and the son is trying to learn and come around and it, the timing just never matches up and that's the tragedy of it the mom gets sick right when the kids like in college and and distracted with other things and they kind of miss their chance and that's you know what makes the letter so gut punching right uh, there's well, so many oh go for it yeah we'll definitely we'll talk more about the letter for sure i think i a moment that always sticks out to me is the moment with the obi-wan kenobi (laughs) action figure yeah and so that is it's basically this moment where uh, the main character as a child has you know has their whole paper menagerie and that's their toys uh, are these animals that have you know they're made of paper but they have had life breathed into them by uh, the mom Mm -hmm. in this story and it's an, this incredible magical thing that you know you could breathe life into a paper tiger and it can roar and it can uh, run around and pounce at things and we as readers are so in awe of something like that because that right. could never exist in our world and then we have this friend who comes over who <laughs> is wielding an obi-wan kenobi action figure that doesn't really look too much like obi-wan kenobi but it does say use the force yeah. and <laughs> it's like this very commodified like anything that plain that any kid could have really sure. and very americanized feeling uh, a toy right and the you know the kid who's the f- I, friend might be the wrong word, but the kid who comes over to play with our main character is like, see how cool my toy is this <laughs> Americanized uh, commodity. And because that is held up as the norm and the standard for what kind of toys people like should be playing with in that society, you know, quote unquote should. Right. And th- our like, despite the magic of our main characters toys and what they have the opportunity to play with they start basically like being jealous and coming around to the way of thinking of the more i guess like majority culture here by being like oh wow like i don't have any cool action figures like that and we actually get this moment where um even even while the paper tiger pounces on the obi-wan kenobi and kind of breaks it then we get the the child uh, who came over crumpling up the tiger and like throwing it away, and that's kind of like the the big turning point where our 
the main character kind of like stops being able to see the paper menagerie for the magic that it is right. uh, and maybe stops seeing the value in uh, like their mother's culture to the sure. same extent that they did initially and it's only later that uh, they get to almost reflect on it and, and see it for what it was. Right. I mean, our main character at the end of the day just wanted to fit in and play with his right. friend and not get made fun of. And he's getting made fun of because his toys are origami, essentially. And um, there's just the this American kid, Mark, doesn't understand it. And that's, like you said, the turning point for our, our main character here. And that's a great moment to pick out it's this idea of like this obi-wan kenobi action figure and then i think at these moments also the the narrator for a while was kind of speculating like maybe they didn't actually move and i was just kind of imagining that um it's hard like i don't necessarily believe that there's lots of things that happen like the mom writes that i think is real but yeah there are these plenty of moments where um where he's doubting that it is real or chooses not to believe in it or the magic of his childhood is kind of dying as he goes off Mm -hmm. to school and college and things like that and i think a lot of moms that can relate to that watching their kids grow up where the the mom's not cool anymore right as you go from your childhood years to your teenage years like in your adolescence and and that's a tough relationship dynamic change and i think like you said this was the turning point in that relationship right and we then have this our main character stops wanting to speak chinese at all only wants to speak english and that sours their relationship so much in addition to some other things with their mother who can speak english to some extent but we get that we get that moment where she's like when i speak english i this is paraphrasing of course when i speak english like i feel here i think that points to her throat right i speak from here i speak from here right and then when i speak chinese it's from my heart and that is something that is i think super hard for a child to be able to grasp like doesn't really get it but us as as readers and and our main character eventually as an adult looking back on those kind of things can start to understand it especially when later it's revealed that like the mother's history with uh english was when she tried to learn it in the past Uh, she if she got caught i think she was she was beaten if i'm remembered remembering correctly because the folks who were in charge of her thought she was going to go to the police and try to like get them in trouble so she has all these negative connotations with english of course she doesn't want to speak it but we don't get to learn that until of course we get to let her we get to understand the uh the mother's perspective absolutely and then also when she does get to america she has no support system no one's teaching her english she's very isolated and anyone that she does try and speak to that would potentially be her son um just tries to correct her and shuts her down. So she becomes very isolated. And that's another tragic thing to watch play out in this story is like the son was kind of the lifeboat for this mother, right? Emotionally right. and and from a cultural point of view as well. And then the son just refuses her as he grows up. And it's um really sad to watch. There's a great, like one of the things I love that starts right at the beginning of this book is the imagery, and again, this, Mr. Miller would have a field day with this, <laughs> is the mom making the origami with Christmas wrapping paper. Mm. <laughs> like, come on. That's like a whole English class metaphor uh, you, you could study on its own, where it's the right. very, very commercialized, you know, candy canes, Christmas trees, and it's just the paper that she has. And she's using that to make her paper menagerie and breathing life into it and things like that. It's a really interesting metaphor for like the different cultures coming together in some way, which I thought was really great. And right away, before we even know what's happening, we're, we're getting hit with these kind of images. Mm. 
That's such an interesting point, Charles. And even after three <laughs> times reading this, I did not really pick up on the potential symbolism of the Christmas gifts being the thing that was used. But it makes so much sense now that you're saying it, where it's almost like trying the, to make the best out of this uh, much more Americanized commodity sized. I don't think that's a word, but uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, um, uh, like gift wrapping and trying to make something of her own culture out of the raw materials that are the like surrounding product more, of American yeah, like culture. Product. Right. Yes. So this idea of her culture, like in enduring in this environment, I, I guess, or maybe it's of this, the, the son himself, who is a combination of both cultures too. Yeah. Uh, you, you can relate him to the tiger and like the tiger kind of gets put in the box, put away, goes dormant. It reflects his relationship with his Chinese heritage as well. So mm. like the metaphor, I, I think that's what makes this appreciated across all kinds of like, literary criticism is is the fact that he does weave in all of these really strong themes from the first page and it's only 20 pages or whatever you know it's really short right. and he spares no word it's all tell no show and it's just like really i mean it's all show no tell i, I flipped them and um mm -hmm. it's just um like you can nitpick every moment in this and and come up with some really interesting metaphors and thematic exploration here but the wrapping paper one stood out to me right away yeah definitely it it's yeah it's so interesting and, that, and that's something to me is like everyone can find and take different things from such a short story and you can keep rereading it and keep finding these new things. Who knew? Who knows how many reads it would have taken me to figure out that wrapping paper <laughs> bit that you were fig figuring out. I mean, but this is why you know you were. This is why you were one of Mr. Miller's favorite students, Charles. You were in that AP English class. So, I was you know, in the AP were, English class. Yeah, we learned how to find metaphors sometimes you where did. they didn't exist, but in this case, I think they were there. Well, um. yeah, and there's that famous. Well, I don't know if famous is the right word, but there's that Ken Liu quote that I've pulled a ton of times at this point, or at least twice, on our podcast, which is about literalizing metaphors. And I, I pulled that when I pitched this to you and basically saying, like, paraphrasing here, uh, that uh, like all fiction is kind of under the same umbrella here of trying to tell these stories and these narratives and the thing about speculative fiction is that the metaphors are just more literalized and mm. the magic of someone's past culture or not past culture the uh, the magic of someone's culture uh like of ancestry maybe is the right way to phrase it like or in this person's case their mother's uh culture uh mm. that they're bringing trying to pass along in many ways to our main character uh, the the magic of that is literalized through these magic right. origami figures that can actually move and you can tell a story like this in another genre like just it could be regular origami instead of magic right. origami but there are ways in which ken lu wields the speculative fiction wand if you will oh, to masterful. to breathe this extra life into I our story <laughs> in much thank you yes in much well now it's weird to finish it but in much the same way that the mother in the story breathes magic into the paper menagerie for sure and to build on that like he uses these speculative fiction elements, but what makes Paper Menagerie stand out a layer beyond that is like how powerful these metaphors are. This idea of the Paper Menagerie and the tiger, it blends all these different themes. You have his, his Chinese heritage, you have his childhood sense of wonder, like this idea of finding, the, like playing with the tiger and loving mm -hmm. it and then not being interested anymore, putting it in the box and then opening it later and rediscovering it, right? This kind of childhood wonder theme. And then the relationship with his mother is the other theme. And this paper menagerie follows him through all three of those. And they're all interconnected in an honest, 
deep, complex way. We know our main, our narrator here was born in the year of the tiger, and and the the parallels between him and the tiger right. are very strong. And it's through all these different lenses that all are related to each other. The fact that he was able to stack them in, in, in so few pages was um, really uh, an incredible achievement. And I think that's why the emotional gut punch when we read the letters is is so strong um another moment that stands out for me is when they is when they we get there's this section where it's like oh mom was bought in a catalog or something like that Mm -hmm. and then there's this great line where the narrator's like what kind of woman puts herself into a catalog so that she can be bought the high school me thought i knew so much about everything contempt felt good like wine Mm -hmm. so like this to me is something that I ring true with of like thinking, you know, being like thinking you understand your parents and being like, you know, that doesn't make sense. Like, why would you do that? Like, how, how could she, it's embarrassing and like writing that off and parallel that now with, he reads the letter and it's like, Oh man, if I had just talked to her, opened up to her, I would know that she was escaping essentially a really horrible situation. Exactly. That was life or death for her. And this was her way out you know her village was taken over she was abducted and you know raised in a home against her will as being like this kind of made person and this way of going to america putting herself in this catalog was her her way out and the idea of the catalog too being a paper device you know it's kind of interesting mm. but uh that metaphor is not as strong but um. I, oh yeah I, I didn't pick up on that one i picked up more on the like she had been commodified as well yes um, yes in sense of being someone who was bought by the father and in a way that's part of the process of her being uh, like taken into this americanized culture of commodification i'm still struggling with that word i think that might be it um and yeah, in in herself made uh, complicit is not the right word, but made a part of it. Like made something else or someone else who was almost treated like something else by nature, being bought from a catalog, and she almost exists in that home as though she were a commodity mm-hmm. and not a person. And it's so sad to see that, right? She's well just said. like a wife. The father is a very complicated figure i think in this story where you can tell that he he means well in a lot of ways like there's points where he's like you should be nicer to your mother and stuff but he's just like for lack of a better way of putting it like not super woke like he's just like not really aware of how to handle this super complex situation that he's kind of been the reason that everyone got wrapped up in oh, uh, wrapped up. no nice. pun in- <laughs> yeah that was totally not pun intended but it's yeah it it's hard because it's like it's kind of his fault and he continues to not do a good job of handling the complications but we don't feel like he's a bad person we just feel like he got himself in over his head with how complicated things have become in that family very well said and then add that with all the people in their environment and it just further separates right separates her um for sure yeah that's very well said i didn't think of it that way but she is commoditized basically she was bought out of the catalog and she never really got to have she never really got to like speak chinese with her son and and continue to mm-hmm. enjoy this hobby of origami together and things like that you know and that's all she really ever wanted which was revealed in the letter as well which extra tragic (laughs) yeah i mean well let's let's talk more about our reactions to the letter than charles i think that that you know that's a close to the story it's the biggest part of the story i would say it's the gut punch as you said yeah tell me more about your reaction besides the fact that you you grew a little bit misty eye uh, <laughs> it's possible it was just allergies but <laughs> definitely not allergies it was from reading the story i think the context of it is really important you know our narrator gets a girlfriend they, they live together um and the girlfriend mm-hmm. kind of discovers these 
And she's like, wow, your mom was an amazing artist. I've never seen origami like right. this. And that's when he's kind of thinking like, oh, yeah, I guess they were nice. Because, you know, right before they went in the box, it was the kid, Mark, being like, your mom makes these from trash. Like, it doesn't look like a tiger at all. Right. And he's like, oh, yeah, they are just pieces of paper. So I I think what's important here is that at the time in the narrator's life, he's kind of reflecting on his childhood and and missing his mom a bit and he was alone in his apartment the the girlfriend was away on a business trip or something and and he was i guess feeling lonely at the time and that's when he like started to pick up the origami again and it started to oh, come back Charles, to life. Oh, Charles, I I know the surrounding of yeah. this. It's uh so she basically said on the like the ch- uh, I I wish I looked up the the name of this, but like the Chinese Day of the Dead, and maybe while I'm talking, oh yeah, it's look um, to Queen see if you can look that up. I know that yeah, from being you. a tea enthusiast. It's an important time of year for when certain teas are picked. It's like really early spring. It's like it's actually coming oh. up. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So some teas are okay. like pre Queen Ming, which is like the first pick of the year, makes them very valuable. I was very proud of myself um, when I knew that <laughs> when I read it in the story. I'm like, I know what's happening. Wow. Yeah. Tell tell me again what uh, the name of it Queen is. Queen Ming is how I say it. Queen I don't Ming. Claim that's the accurate way to pronounce right. it, but Q I N G M I N G. King All right, Ming. Well, we'll, we'll we'll do our best here, and apologies to uh, any folks out there who, if we aren't pronouncing it correctly. But when Queen Ming comes up, uh, basically he'd already been told by the mother when she was dying that. If he thought of her, like she, he basically was asked to think of her on that day, mm-hmm. a, and then she could communicate with him to some extent. She didn't say really how, and that was maybe the last thing she basically told him before she died. Just like think of me on that day. Yeah, that was like her and last request. I think it's basically. like years, right? And it's like years pass and he just happens to be watching a shark documentary and it just so happens to be that day so he didn't listen right he wasn't like oh i'll think of her on that day he's just like oh like shark week and (laughs) then he's watching this shark documentary and he's like oh like just comes into his mind the shark that she made for him that was earlier in the story that like went in the fishbowl and kind of <laughs> like got messed up yeah. because paper shouldn't go in water yeah. and like thinking about that and thinking about the t- the tiger and then of course think like because the tiger there's that moment where the tiger's like looking into the fishbowl yeah. and the eyes are big <laughs> and thinking about all that and uh, uh, because of that thinking about uh, the mother and the moment of having uh, on that day, thinking about the mother made the tiger come back to life mm-hmm. and kind of like he, he actually thinks, which is maybe interesting at first, too, like he thinks that it's some waste paper and he goes like trash, right? Like right. Mark uh, said. So he goes to go pick up the what he thinks is trash and he discovers that it's actually the magic origami come back to life. And, you know, Mr. Miller would probably appreciate uh, that bit. Like, oh, is this trash? No, it's magic. Yeah. And that's when things start to move back in the other direction yeah. toward and like, rediscovering like, yeah, the thinking magic. Thinking about your mom breathes life into this memory right. that you had, which, you know, there's a lot to digest in that as well. And, and it's this idea of like, yeah, she's gone, but there's parts of your identity that you know will always be there and there's this appreciation for certain memories that you had with your mother that um will on certain days bring comfort and things like that and that's what you know even just saying that is very emotional so um yeah it was Whoa, a great... Charles, you grown is that allergies or just getting a little misty eyed over there <laughs> um yeah, well, it's 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 emotional, you know. It's emotional. There's no allergies. I'm indoors. It's all good. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, and then he gets the he discovers the letter, but he can't read it. That's another thing. It's like he doesn't yes. know what it says. His mom wrote it in Chinese. He recognizes the word for son, but that's about it as far as he gets. Mm. And he has to go to um, someone. He goes to like a 
area with a lot of Chinese tour buses, and he's asked a stranger to translate it for him. And that's how he interprets the letter. And that's another thing of like how removed he has been for so long that he can't communicate with his mom directly. You know, it's still this like uncomfortable, hard to do thing that he has to reach out to someone that can speak Chinese just to get the letter translated. Mm, yeah, I think someone, I think the our main character can understand Chinese when it's spoken, but can't read it. So basically, I, I think it is read to uh, our main character in Chinese. And I think that that's another interesting moment that sticks out to me is kind of that this super intimate moment with almost like that feels like it's just the mother finally communicating directly with the our main character her son and like our main character has to share that with some stranger and kind of like can't escape that stranger's theoretical judgment it's not like there's this moment where it's like uh there there's no indication that the stranger is judging them but there's the fact that they have to have a witness yeah. look at them so there's no escape of like rationalizing or justifying away. It's like this is someone who's unbiased who is telling you the like your mother's story and you're going to have to sit here and, and listen and make an attempt to see it through those eyes. Right. And there's so many of these moments that kind of pay off in this letter. She's there's all these great lines about oh with Qing Ming the spirits will allow me to speak to you and I have to write with all my heart so I need to write with you in Chinese and right. and all of these other things coming together that he's already in 20 pages developed this set off set up and payoff situation and you know I, I think when anyone talks about their emotional reaction it's it's this letter so really fantastic stuff well I mean I get I get those misty eye moments actually throughout, but this is the moment where uh, the the times in which I start bawling, it's always been this moment here. And you just, you know, it's an important lesson for sure for those of us, if if we're lucky enough to have our, our parents still around and have the opportunity to tr- try to take these lessons away right. uh, that we can try to bring those into our lives while we still have the chance to do so. I know that that's something I, I took away from this story sure. because this the super tragic part for the character here is it's too late to ever really like patch things up and have this heart to heart with their mother. It's like they can think of her and have these moments with the tiger and get the sense that there's a piece of her still around but can never really have this sit down and like patch things up and resolve all these loose ends but hopefully we as readers can take this away and and bring all these wonderfully explored themes into our own life in a way that makes things better for us well said and i think that comes home when i'm going to quote the letter here where the mother goes you know what the chinese think is the saddest feeling in the world it's for a child to finally grow the desire to take care of his parents only to realize that they were long gone and that is such a powerful statement especially when you consider the mother's history she didn't get that opportunity because her parents were killed and Now, our narrator doesn't get the chance because he had grown distant to his mom and his mom got sick and died when he was you know, still kind of young. And after he reads that, he asks for help to write the character I, A-I, which is Chinese for love. So he writes it over and over again on the letter and traces it. And then we walk away with him cradling the tiger. And it's like, wow, so many. He's like come full circle with his relationship with his mother and he's kind of understood his mother for the first time actually and it's just a really emotional process to watch him go through and i think we can all take some of that into our personal lives for sure well said charles well paper menagerie ken Liu, amazing story very well written um 
I, I'm looking forward to reading some more of his work in the future. Yes. But this was a great, great start. Yeah. Well, Charles, I think on that note, I'm super excited for us to. Uh, I'm also a little <laughs> sorry. Yeah, talking about the ending is is uh, is very emotional. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, <laughs> usually, I think we try to end on this kind of like, yeah, like, well, we're so excited to. Yeah. Like, I'm like, uh, but, so sad. It's like I'm, I'm kind of reeling but, from rereading the letter here. Right, I have the book open in front yeah, of me, and it's you, like you the I don't know what to do from what to, to do with this <laughs> information. Right, <laughs> we're gonna go process like, our feelings right now. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think that's a good idea. And <laughs> like, I didn't know you were gonna pull the letter. So that, I mean, no, it's a great, it was I mean, a great quote the, to yeah, drop. Yeah, buddy, reading oh, it, no, I think it's, it's important to invoke some of these emotions. It's so powerful, and um, yeah, those those last few moments kind of leave us like, well, I guess we're gonna end the show now. But um, right, go forth, everyone, with love, I suppose. <laughs> and um, yes. Yeah, I'm just excited for next time, and uh, I guess we'll get that sweet, sweet outro music going. Yeah, get going. I am, I am excited to get into more of these stories with you, Charles. I'm, I'm sure you're all in on Ken Liu's work oh, after for that sure. one, yeah. right? Yeah, it's excellent. So here's yeah, to we'll sprinkle them in throughout. Sprinkle them in, pepper them throughout our our buddy lists, you know. Yeah. Um, all right, let's get into the outro. Thank you, everyone, for listening to yet another very exciting, very special episode of the Friends Talking Fantasy Podcast. If you like what you heard today and you want to support the show, reach out to us, engage with us over on Twitter at the FTF Podcast with a number one at the end. We are also... Hashtag mission make Charles cry. Yeah. Well, we got we got close a couple of times just recording yeah, close. this. Um, so uh, definitely check that out. You can always send us an email as well which is the FDF podcast at gmail.com. Now, Dylan, if they wanted to further support the show and they just so happen to be listening on Apple Podcasts, what can they do to help us out? Toss five stars to our podcast. Yes. Just find the Friends Talking Fantasy page on the Apple Podcast app and scroll down until you're seeing stars. Once you're seeing stars, uh, we would love it if you clicked five of those stars. That's the, the best number to help us out. Yes. And then if you do have a little bit of extra time, then leaving a review is super helpful as well. But just listening is more than enough we appreciate you tuning in today thank you so much thank you all for listening we greatly appreciate it thank you thank you thank you and as always go forth and conquer friends <laughs>